um, the opening slide shows Wendell Berry in his various poses and depictions. The one in the lower left is how most people think of Wendell Berry, or the upper left in his younger years, pensive, serious, earnest, maybe even a little bit overbearing. He is those things, but he's not just those things. He is joyful. He's full of humor. He laughs. He laughs at himself. And he has coursing through him, and that's why I love the graphic woodcut that I placed uh, in the center at the bottom. Coursing through him is everything, the land, the roads, the way that the land has been marred, as you see in the bridge. That's really a marring, a scarring of the land, but maybe a necessary one for the proper stewardship of a farm. And you see the wild geese uh, on his, the back of his head and his cap. It's probably safe to say they're always flying through his brain, through his soul. And that's a proper symbolizing of who he is. In the center of this opening slide, I placed his farm, which he has bequeathed to St. Catherine's order um, and gave um, a while back um, so that it might be taken care of by people that would really treasure it and not sell it off to big agribusiness. But it is this farm in Henry County where he was born and where his family lived and where he raised children. He went away from it and came back. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But it is this farm that is him. And he understands himself to be inextricably bonded to part of the farm and the farm, the land, and its sky, part of him. That's ever so essential to understand who Wendell Berry is. Next slide. Here's a bunch of pictures, and uh, you'll see I'll reference this as we go through. I'll try to uh, point out some of these pictures and some of these uh, uh, moments in his life. But you see him as a long, tall, gangly uh, person with his feet up. And this is his uh, little hut that has no electricity in it. This is where he writes in the upper left-hand corner. Um, the woods where he raised his two children. And then he and his wife, Tanya, uh, as they're going over some of his writing, he writes in longhand, always has, continues to write in longhand during the day. It's an act of stewardship. He doesn't want to use electricity to uh, burn in the middle of the night. Uh, he says he's pretty efficient. When he goes there, He's not distracted. He goes and immediately takes up the writing. Um, I put Tanya and him in the center of this because she is an essential partner. He is an essential partner. Their marriage is at the center of their life together. You see him age from a person with dark and a big chalk of uh, dark hair to a balding person, I'm so glad that I have a bond in the balding category and the balding uh, uh, territory with him. Um, and also um, his sense of humor, his peace sign in front of the uh, uh, solar panels, as which he champions as a way to uh, save uh, planet Earth. Um, the picture of him with the cap talking to the person, he's laughing, she's smiling. This is uh, them at the state capitol, Frankfurt, uh, as they are trying to adjudicate and press for some legislation uh, against the coal industry in uh, Kentucky. And you see him uh, receiving the Medal of Honor, uh, excuse me, the Medal of Freedom uh, 
uh, not receiving, but at a reception after he's received that at the White House. Uh, Wendell Berry was born in, in 1934, August the 5th, by the way, if you keep a hagiography and keep a list of, of uh, dates on your calendar, mark down August the 5th, that's his birthday, and he will be 87 uh, this coming August the 5th. Um, he was born in Henry County. His father was a lawyer. His mother was a librarian um, and a ho homemaker. Uh, he attended in high school, uh, Millersburg Military Institute, a secondary school, and graduated from that, then went on to the University of Kentucky, where he got an undergraduate degree and then got a graduate degree, and then in 1959 went to uh, University of Stanford University to the Wallace Stegner Fellowship. Wallace Stegner, we'll see his countenance later on during this presentation, uh, angle of repose, a person of great, great literary power and talent, established um, a literary fellowship, it was established in his name at, the, uh, at Stanford University. And these were the people that Wendell Berry got to hang out with. Jack Carroll, uh, excuse me, Ken Kesey, Ernest Gaines, Edward Abbey, Larry McMurtry, Tilly Olson, Robert Stone. All these would become, half of them would become Pulitzer Prize winners, by the way. And sadly, Wendell Berry never got to join their ranks. He's never won the Pulitzer Prize. He's been nominated, but never won it. He should, he should be received the Nobel Prize. Um, he taught in New York for a while and then moved back to the family farm in 1964, 1965. Uh, he had a Guggenheim Fellowship and traveled Italy, et cetera came back and on July the 4th, 1965, moved to the farm permanently. He would become a professor at the University of Kentucky. Then in 1977, he retired or resigned um, and went to writing full time. It is at about that time that he uh, published this book that uh, our friends out in the hinterland of, uh, can you see this? The Unsettling of America. And I, re I, I look back on this, back in the way back, uh, Kay, and uh, that I bought this when it first came out. I had just graduated from TCU and was on my way to graduate school to, go, to be a minister. And I remember buying this. And I just found this uh, as I'm packing up to move. Uh, and I, but I'd reference it many times. I've looked at it hundreds of times. He's got a great, great essay or a portion of this book where he talks about women and the land or relationships and the land. Read that, find that portion of the book and you will really be, uh, you'll have a new perspective on uh, Donald Trump, by the way. Where to start among his 80 books, and this is just a portion of them. I have intentionally enlarged the books that I think are really, really important. And the first one is The Hidden Wound that he wrote in 1970 or published in 1970. I believe that he began writing it in 1968 or 69 after the assassination of Martin Luther King, as well as Bobby Kennedy, the unrest that was connected with uh, race hate, et cetera, across the land. And um, I would highly, highly recommend this book. And it is an account of what racism does, not only to black people, but to white people and what it does to a community and how it must be dealt with if the community is to be made whole. Obviously I've made the unsettling of America, cultural and agriculture larger. In this book, <laughs> he describes the American kitchen as a disaster zone. 
uh, that it uses way too much electricity. This is why Priscilla and I do not own an electric can opener. That's one of the, we own a lot of other electric things. We're not purists, by the way, but we don't own an electric can opener because my God, how long does it take? Unless you have crippling arthritis, that I could understand that. But you can do a manual. Most of us can do that. So the unsettling of America is also large. Wendell Berry's uh, novel, Jaber Crow, is also large. It's 1990 is its publication date. It's not the first novel he prints, nor is it the first of this um, mythical kingdom that he's created in Port William. Port William is like Port Royal meaning Port Royal is the model for Port William. And I'd love Kay and her husband to kind of weigh in on this, by the way. You guys know this much better than I do, I believe. Um, but Jaber Crow is the novel that Wendell Berry enthusiasts, like my friend Johnny Ray in Mississippi, they absolutely love that book. So did my best friend in seminary. Jeff Blum read this. Um, and just fell in love with it and would recommend it, you know, night and day. Timbered Choir would be bigger if all of the poems that are in Timbered Choir weren't also in this day, which is all of the Sabbath poems up to, I think, uh, 20, 2014, 2015. He's had some other Sabbath poems that have been published in a book called uh, is it this porch? And um, uh, there, there are some new Sabbath poems. I want to say a, a word about these Sabbath poems. He writes the Sabbath poems on the land and not just in his study. The portrait that he paints is that he goes walking on the land, I guess with a legal pad or some kind of paper and a pencil with him. And he writes them on the land on the Sabbath. His Sabbath as a Christian is Sunday. And he writes these poems, and some of them are metered. Some of them rhyme. Some of them are free verse. They have various, various forms. They're extraordinary. And they're like the book of Psalms. They approach the status of Scripture to me in their exceeding eloquence, in their beauty, and in their connection, that, that touching point between humanity and God. They do that as good as any literature in America. Denise Levertov and Mary Oliver would be close seconds, but they really can't take first place. Wendell Berry is the top of the heap. If you needed a spiritual book for a retreat or a book that you thought would be spiritual or help you connect to the divine or mystery or whatever, or soothe your soul or irritate it to a point of growth and, and well-being, you would do yourself a favor by buying a hardcover version of this day, Collected and New Sabbath Poems. I put in there why I'm not going to buy a computer. It's a short book. It's not a very big book, but um, we need to hear from uh, Barry and others like David James Duncan, uh, who he teamed up and wrote a thing called Citizenship. Uh, uh, oh boy, not Citizenship Papers, uh, Citizen Descent in 2003. And David James Duncan, is the closest that we have to a literary person who's an environmentalist, but he's not a farmer like uh, Barry is. And by the way, what kind of farmer is he? He's a horse-drawn plow farmer. What can a family manage? They can maybe manage, as his family has, 125 acres, but that's it. 
That's what his family could manage. He's not going to buy more land to produce more crops, more hay, more corn, more tobacco. He's not going to do that. That's what they can take. That's what they can do. And that's what they're, they're, uh, that's what they bequeath to the sisters of, at St. Catherine. Um, he's won all kinds of prizes. He's won every, you know, from the Academy of Arts and Sciences, from the Academy of Arts and letters. He's won almost every major poetry prize there is. And then, you know, he's won the, the National Medal of Freedom, uh, National Humanities Medal, excuse me, from Barack Obama uh, in 2011. As I said, I believe that he is the bearer of the legacy of both Walt Whitman in love of people, common people in particular, and champion for justice and rightness and moral rectitude, and Emily Dickinson's formalism and her attention to detail and the whispers of the spirit. I think he embodies both of those traditions in himself and in, do, in doing so, he um, is a poet par excellence. Next slide. Here, here we enter into the themes of uh, what Wendell Berry kind of majors in, if, if you will. Um, it's love uh, that keeps him close to the ways of Jesus, all right? Uh, he says, I take literally the statement in the Gospel of John that God loves the world. I believe that the world was created and approved by love, that it subsists, coheres, and endures by love, and that insofar as it is redeemable, it can be redeemed only by love. I believe that divine love incarnate and indwelling in the world summons the world always towards wholeness, ultimately, which is ultimately, is re which re ultimately is reconciliation and atonement with God. But also he says in What Are People For, this beautiful, beautiful statement about love never being abstract. And if you don't mind, can we read this together out loud? I'll do the pace. You can follow along. I don't read slowly, but I don't read like a jackrabbit either. So I think you'll be able to keep up. Here we go. Love, love is never, never abstract. abstract. It does not adhere to the universe or the planet or the nation or the institution or the profession, but to the singular sparrows of the street, the lilies of the field, the least of these are brethren. Love is not by its own desire heroic. It is heroic only when compelled to be. It exists by its willingness to be anonymous, humble, and unrewarded. The older love becomes, the more clearly it understands its involvement in partiality, imperfection, suffering, and mortality. Even so, it longs for incarnation. It can no longer live by thinking. I just think that it's one of the most profound statements on love and that we would do well if we could uh, follow his dictate. Here is a picture of Wallace Stegner in the lower left-hand column. He says in this beautiful, beautiful statement, a teacher's major contribution may pop out anonymously in the life of some ex-student's uh, grandchild. A teacher finally has nothing to go on but faith. A student nothing to offer in return but testimony. So Donna Clark, what grade did you teach? Uh, you're, you're on mute. What, what grade did you teach, Donna? Kindergarten through eight. So Kindergarten not all through at the eight. same time, but the last 20 years were seventh grade reading at Raytown Middle School. All right. So Lee Williams has, all right. And Lee Williams also has this in her background, both as a teacher and as a librarian. Your contributions and others of you who may be teachers that I don't know about, but your contributions are gonna be tremendous. They will pop out, as he says, 
anonymously, maybe not in the ones that you taught, but in their progeny or their progeny's progeny. I put on the right-hand side pictures of Wendell Berry and Gary Snyder, two great poets, two very different kind of poets, and they would meet at the Stegner Fellowship and come under the influence of Wallace Stegner. Um, Nathan Coulter was the product of uh, Barry's time in the fellowship there in uh, Palo Alto, but he would become friends with and have a lifelong correspondence with Gary Snyder, all because they came under, to use a good Barry word, the tutelage and submitted to Wallace Stegner's influence on their life. Submission is a very, very good word for, for, uh, for Barry. So, and it's not like submission slavishly submitting or in a way that denigrates the human spirit, but submitting in an act of discipline and an act of appreciation. So he wants to honor and appreciate. I put this in here you're not going to find this too many things in, in too many of the interpreters of Barry. But I thought to myself, why are we really looking at Barry? Because we ought to follow his lead and honor and appreciate those who have been teaching us, those who have been impacting us. We ought to be part of, he has done nothing except on faith, right? And we students have nothing in to offer in return but testimony. So we ought to testify and give testimony to how Wendell Berry has helped our lives to prosper. All right, which leaves us, leads us to the next slide where I wanna talk a little bit about economy. Wendell Berry is doing battle constantly, as he has almost his entire life, with money economy. He has a book called Sex, Economy, and Community, an extraordinarily good book. You ought to read it. And in it, you'll find that he will not define economy as a series of transactions and what one consumes and what one pays for what consumes and how, does, how do things get produced. He wants to talk about what makes up a community. And he says this wonderful, wonderful phrase in an interview with the woman who um, produced a great documentary that we'll cite later on this morning or this afternoon, this morning, um, the world, unless you're in prison, is full of free things that are delightful. And so pay attention to those free things. Obviously, when he went to farm, you see him here standing up in a wagon behind these, I think they're draft horses. They don't look quite big enough to be draft horses, but I'm assuming there's some smaller version because draft horses are the best uh, to, to farm with. Um, pulling his, this uh, wagon out of the barn on his land and not saying, well, how do I get a bigger and better and more efficient tractor? No, he's going to use a buggy, a wagon, and some horses. The world, unless you're in prison, is full of free things that are delightful which leads also to his generosity of spirit, his understanding of the nature of what it means to be a fulfilled and fulfilling human being in relationship with others. And that is not just an attitude, but the practice and the disciplines of generosity. He says in one of his Sabbath poems, every day you have less reason not to give yourself away, which I believe is uh, a lesson you can learn if you ever start to uh, move. I think that I've mentioned this before, but it's become really real in the last month. A lot of stuff that I think is crap that we put out on the curb 
people came and just gathered up in the middle of the night at the, the light pole out in front of our house because they can use it. Potting uh, implements for gardening. I put out an old weed eater that I thought was, you know, decrepit. Somebody took it. I didn't have to throw it away. I didn't have to give it to the landfill. We could use it. We had a bunch of pallets that we put on, you know, boxes for Christmas ornaments and all that kind of stuff. We had a lot of pallets in our basement. Our basement looks better than it's ever looked. <laughs> we put out all these pallets and the pallets went like this. And the biggest thing is neighbor.com or something like that, nor nextdoor.com, and then uh, Facebook Marketplace. Now, let me talk about one of the contradictions of this presentation on Wendell Berry right now. Remember that he wrote a book, Why I Will Not Buy a Computer. Remember that he does not own a cell phone. Remember that he will not participate in this Zoom call or any other. Remember that when uh, the woman was making the documentary look and see about him, he refused to be filmed. He wouldn't refuse to be recorded on audio tape, but he refused to be filmed. He doesn't believe in the intrusion of technology. He thinks it's quasi evil. He doesn't believe all institutions are evil like my friend Will Campbell does. He, Will believed all institutions, including the church, were all evil. He doesn't believe that. But the, the great irony or contradiction of this presentation is that we're using a technology that Wendell Berry refused us to acknowledge, endorse, or even affirm. Okay? You need to know that. But the only reason that we get to do that is because of this. And I would push back with, with uh, Wendell Berry and say, in Africa, telemedicine will allow a child not to be crippled by a disease if the proper instructions and remedial medication and treatment can be communicated on a Zoom call. I would push back and say, that those farmers in Kentucky might have access to good information and also political lobbying leverage if they would participate. And as I do every Monday, the Missouri Coalition on Voter Protection, where I learned from Denise Lieberman all the nefarious ways that people are trying to rob citizens of their capacity to vote. <laughs> so, I'm going to part ways with Wendell, and one day maybe we can respectfully have a cup of coffee there at the Berry Center in Kentucky, but I'm going to tell you, I've parted ways with mentors before, and I'm going to part ways with him now. I'm glad that Brent is recording this, that I can see your faces. It's real two-dimensional. It's real kind of fakey, yeah, but we're getting some conversation going and to quote Wendell Berry, conversation is good to the alternative, which is that we kill each other, okay? So let's continue the conversation via Zoom. Here are some video resources that you can have, and once this goes um, viral, so to speak. <laughs> See, Berry would point out viral means that it's a virus, that it's a disease, and you gotta watch it. <laughs> um, Bill Moyers has a wonderful interview with him. Uh, Wendell Berry's um, lecture, the, the 41st Annual Jefferson Lecture, is an extraordinary uh, piece of uh, literature. His commencement uh, address to Sterling College, where there is a Wendell Berry farming program that has been established, and that just happened in May. Check that out, all right? It's actually his uh, ex a commencement address and also, I put down two things here, I'm sorry. Um, that la I, That's my mistake, uh, Brent. I'll send you a corrected slide deck here. That should say the, the, the Barry Center intro, uh, where it says Barry Center Org Resources. 
Um, I'll send you a correct, that's the wrong title there. But those are all good resources for you to find out about Wendell Berry and something, uh, some contemporary uh, pieces. I'm going to recommend this because this has been a long time in coming. And you're going to see a little trailer that Brent is going to put up here, a thing called Look and See. This began as a piece that was titled The Seer. And I like that they switched it to look and see, which is a command, an invitation. It's very biblical, by the way. Uh, The Gospel of John repeats, I don't know, I think 12 times this phrase, come and see, come and see, come and see. So the producer and director of the documentary and Wendell Berry, by implication, are invoking the New Testament almost, if you will. And it might be that Wendell Berry would say that his vocation has been to look and try to see what can be seen. And that's the name of this uh, documentary about Wendell Berry. Here we go. Even while I dreamed, I prayed that what I saw was only fear and no foretelling. For I saw the last known landscape destroyed for the sake of the objective. The soil bulldozed, the rock blasted. Those who had wanted to go home would never get there now. I saw the forest reduced to stumps and gullies. I saw the poisoned river, the mountain cast into the valley. I came to the city that nobody recognized because it looked like every other city. Men and women and children now pursued the objective as if nobody ever had pursued it before. The once enslaved, the once oppressed were now free to sell themselves to the highest bidder and to enter the best paying prisons in pursuit of the objective, which was the destruction of all enemies, which was the destruction of all obstacles, which was to clear the way to victory, which was to clear the way to self-creation from which nobody who ever wanted to go home would ever get there now. For every remembered place had been displaced, every love unloved, every vow unsworn to make way for the passage of the crowd, of the individuated, the autonomous, the self-actuated, the homeless, with their many eyes opened only toward the objective which they did not yet perceive in the far distance, having never known where they were going, having never known where they came from. I wanted to include that because you get to hear Wendell Berry's voice. It's Kentucky lilt. It's generosity of spirit. It's gentleness, but also it's urgency. Wendell Berry is a patient man, but he is also an urgent man. And he has urgently inspired millions of people both here and throughout the country and, the, and, and around the world to be about the business of taking care of what we can poetically call our island and our only home. It may be too late, by the way, it may be too late to finally save the world and Barry would caution us against prideful uh, fulfillment of the task of saving the world. He quotes his father in that New Yorker article by Amanda uh, Superfridge, where he says, his father said to him one time, they were sitting looking out at the dark. I think they were sitting in the home on the porch. And he says, I've had a good life. 
and I've had nothing to do with it. Meaning it was all, as Wendell Berry says in one of his books, given. Now you're good stewards of what you're given. You act responsibly and in concert in a community, you can make a huge difference and not squander what has been given. But it has all been given. One summer I was writing some poems and I was trying to think as a Christian, what are good synonyms for grace? You know, grace, what a great word, grace. But what would be a plain word that would poetically capture the word grace, the generosity of God's spirit, the generosity of God's love? What, what would be a good word? And damn, if Wendell Berry didn't steal my word. Before I could come up with it, I found out he wrote a book and entitled it Given. I said, damn, that's the word. Given is the absolute synonym for grace. It is what is given. He stole the word right from out from under me. Damn him. So, but I'm grateful that that given has been given and that he has granted unto us some new metaphors, new poetic ways of understanding how life is much graced. I'd like us to say this prayer together and uh, let it rest in your, don't rush, around, rush to the end. No, 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 no. Just stay with your eyes fixed only to the first line, okay? Because you, you need to let this, this is a portion of a poem, and you just need to let it creep up on you, all right? Let's say this together. I know that I have life only insofar as I have love. I have no love except it come from thee. Help me, please, to carry this candle against the wind. By the way, his use of the word thee invokes the King James version of the Bible, doesn't it? And that's the, the version that he hews to and that he defaults to, to use a contemporary non Wendell Berryan kind of word. He goes to the King James version because of its richness of language. By the way, a New Testament scholar and translator of the Bible once told me, I said, is it true to say that the New Revised Standard Version is maybe the most accurate, literally, that we can get in terms of all the versions? And he said, yes. And I said, is it also true that the Revised Standard Version and also, but that the New Revised Standard Version loses the poetry? And you can only really get the poetry in the old Revised Standard Version and King James Version. He says, absolutely. <laughs> so those uh, intonations in the King James Version and also the Revised Standard Version, the these and the thous are there when addressing God and uh, Wendell Berry maintains those. This coming week, um, I would suggest that you do these. I, I bolded some of these lines just to give it some contrast so you could follow your eyes one to another, that um, you try these out. These are very Wendell Berry induced and influenced suggestions, such as quieting your mind, heart and soul with the time of rest and reflection and considering the realities which really last and are part of God's eternal nature, like the seasons, like decay and fecundity, but also springtime and harvest. Remember those? Pray that your daily routine will be commensurate with an ecologically sound approach to conserving the earth as the home for humanity's coming generations. Some of you take walks, and I bet you you pick up trash as you go along. Even if it's just a meager little teeny tiny cigarette butt, but making the world a little bit better for yourself or using less paper towels than you normally need to. Um, pondering the significance and power of place in your life. We have very, very little help with this except from people like Wendell Berry 
and Wes Jackson and Gary Snyder to talk about the importance of place. There's a new thing. Those of you who are educators, Tom Vander Ark with Getting Smart has been majoring in place-based education these days. And that is a new thing that is coming into the curriculum in K through 12 education of place-based education. In my view, everybody who lives within the confines of the Kansas City city limits ought to know 18th and Vine and ought to go to the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum and I'll take you on a tour if you want. And we go and I'll show you the sense of that place, its importance. If you go to Nashville, Tennessee, you better go to Percy Warner Park. It's holy. As my professor of poetry, Betsy Colquitt, told me back at TCU when I asked her, are there any holy places in Nashville? Yes, go to Percy Warner Park. I don't know what she did at post Percy Warner Park to encounter the holy there, but I went and she was right. There are places everywhere and our sense of place, where we are, where we live is important. Pray for good work to do. And the phrase that I use that Donna Clark probably heard me say too many times, what is the work that has been set to your hands? What is that work? Pray for strength to give to God and your neighbors the best work that is in you. You can be retired and still have work to do, by the way. And count the ways that Sabbath has happened for you this week. Sabbath doesn't happen just on a Sunday. It happens all the time when we're in the presence of Shalom. So I'm gonna call on Kay and Pete to maybe yeah. share their experience of Wendell Berry. I'll let you go okay. first and then I'll... Um, well, it was through um, Wes Jackson at the Land Institute of why we got to go. And although there are no pictures, or hardly any pictures or videos, it is to me, um, a video I've watched many, many, many times because it's so vivid. <laughs> we got we got to spend the whole day. Um, I guess the striking thing to me was, in addition to him being who he is, period, he is just such a humanitarian with the most simplest of conversations and statements. Um, one of the things he we drove we got to drive around with him in his old truck throughout Henry, the county. At high speed. <laughs> and to his daughter's dismay, I think. <laughs> um, but he just pointed out farms and different things. And the, the quote I remember the most was, um, we're driving and he's talking about a, a farm that they had to declare bankruptcy. And he said, our hearts were broken, but I guess that's why we have one. Hmm. Nice. And we got to walk the land with him. Um, he, in addition, we didn't see his writing studio upstairs, but we walked the land and he has an old, I always kind of forget what kind of boat it is. Someone gave him an old fishing boat that's out in the woods with a deck on it. And that is also where he writes. And it's just, again, the simplest. Um, of things. Um, he, somebody gave him an old tobacco shed because there's so many around there and he kept his implements, simple implements. And he had a, he had a writing desk in there that one of the, I think one of the pastors of their church um, was free to come and sit in that writing desk in the tobacco shed and write Nice. <laughs> so those are my initial. Go ahead. <clears throat> I'm probably going to have. <laughs> I'm going to have trouble saying what I want to say. Because a few times in my life. I've known that I was in the presence of a holy man. 
And I knew it then. And it's <clears throat> not unlike being with the Dalai Lama, if you will. When you're in his presence, you know that he is a vessel for the message of the holy. That's, that's his mission. That's, that's his job, if you will. That's why he doesn't want to be seen. He doesn't want to be thought of as an individual because he speaks for the holy. So um, I was introduced to Wendell decades ago by a dear friend who knew both, who knew me and my father. I consider he's since passed on. I considered him a guardian angel. I, I think there are people and people throughout my life who have guided me toward who I am. And he gave me in 1985, he gave me two books. And again, this person knew me better than I knew myself at the time. And, and those two books were The Unsettling of America by Wendell Berry. The second book was New Roots for Agriculture by Wes Jackson. And he said, you need to read these books. And I did. And they have a, they, those two books have affected my life from that day forward. And those two gentlemen... My, my father had died. I, was look, I didn't know it, but I was looking for mentors. And both of those men became my mentors. I began to absorb everything they had to say from that point forward because it resonated with me. And I'm quoting from my father for a moment. And he said, we don't own this land. We're caretakers for a while. So, um, it was profound. Um, it's on the scotch. <laughs> yeah, I, I said to others, I said, if we go to Kentucky and see Wendell Berry, and if he offers me scotch at the end of the day, I'm going to drink it. <laughs> and we did. <laughs> so... We got to drink the holy wine <laughs> in his kitchen. Um, he is every bit of what you say he is. And so is Tanya. And, oh, and let's not you forget can't leave that. Her out. <laughs> and believe me, boy, talk about a straight spoken woman. <laughs> um, we have added uh, anecdotes we could take care, share about both Tanya and Mary. These are such real grounded people who know what their mission is in life. And so there's, it's not just Wendell, it's the, the and his son, the community around him. Um, again, by the way, I, I am the, the other theme that was so clear. And if you read the Port William novels, and I've read a number of them, the theme that comes out, is that everybody is a member of the community. There, no one is cast out, no one. And I grew up in a community like that as a child where we all understood that Kenny was the town drunk, but he was not cast out. I, I can remember that. And so when I read that and when I was with Wendell and he would go by a house and say, we talked about that and all of the heartbreak this person died, could not afford a funeral. We gathered, dug his grave, and buried him beside the porch. Can you imagine a community that will do that for its members? That will do that. So it was a day I'll never forget. I would like to have... I've thought of a thousand things. <laughs> and by the way, there was, you know, Bob, I, I was aware going to this conversation, I had already read of his criticism of wind farming. 
you may recall a quote where he says, there are not sacred and unsacred places. There are sacred places and desecrated places. <laughs> and I know that Wendell would look at this industrial wind farm and say, I have desecrated this land. I know that. And that's hard for me to, I did that. I know that. And yet I have such a deep, unbreakable love for this place that I can't comprehend. But I know there are those who criticize what I did and in some ways rightly so. Anyway, <laughs> I should open the floor for others who may have comments. I, I've let, read- let me, uh, let me try to t tie this together uh, and give you an affirmation, Pete. I'm so glad that your wind farm is there. <laughs> and we'll have to just be shoulder to shoulder and arm in arm to resist <laughs> to say no window sorry <laughs> well it, we can differ we can differ right. we I can think, yeah. but here is okay i'm going to go to the math of this because i have i have audience with world class scientists who have pointed out to me that yes the fuel is free and renewable but construction of the machinery to extract renewable energy, when we talk about the steel, the copper, the rare earth minerals, the mining of those materials will have a more devastating effect than coal. Mm. Yep. We got to keep on the conversation. Yeah. Yes, there's other ways. There are other ways. Uh, two quotes to end with. Uh, uh, he, he cites his father as impacting him about words and the importance of language. And he tells the story about how his father loved this story. He didn't think that it originated with him, but it was um, a young lawyer asking some questions of a witness and ask, who instigated the altercation? And an older, wiser lawyer punched him on the shoulder and said, ask him who started the fight. <laughs> that straightforward language you will find in Wendell Berry again and again and again and again. And this will also help, he thinks, that the conversation and it may be that we need to ask Wendell right now before, I mean, he's 87 come August. We only have a few more years with him. Even if he lives into his 90s, this project of having a conversation as a country is going to go on for a good little while. We might want to ask him, how can we best have a conversation being so apparently polarized, being so apparently divided? And he says this, I think our conversation is worth more right now than any of us think separately. Hmm. And that is true. We don't need to wait for some singular savior to give us the word from on high. Wendell points us to a conversation being where salvation can be found.